Thank you for the introduction and thanks for the organizers for the invitation to give this talk. And hopefully you are all seeing this uh, clearly and hearing me clearly, but of course, please interrupt if uh, some technology failure, even after these many years, does hit us. So today I'll talk about counting with new tools and in particular, coming from uh, an interesting background, including uh, being trained in analysis, I'll try to describe some of the combinations of fields that come together in recent, recent work in arithmetic statistics. So even though I'm uh, sure there's been plenty of exciting arithmetic statistics talks in this seminar, hopefully there's a little bit of a, a different spin or different take on it that maybe I can provide in, in this lecture. So let me start out by defining roughly what I mean by this area. And as I said, coming from being trained in analysis, I'll, I'll make this uh, particularly vague, but say, some of the questions I've recently been interested in lie in counts or statistics for objects of arithmetic interest. And maybe it's poor to define something using the word that appears in the definition in your definition, but bear with me <laughs> as, I, as I take such liberty. So let me give some examples. So such as fields, polynomials, elliptic curves, et cetera. And one of the things that drew me to number theory, I'm sure many of you, and in particular to this area, is that oftentimes these questions are easy to state and they're important, but they are hard to prove, or in this case, hard to count. So counting is something that's so fundamental when you arise with something that's hard to count. Uh, oftentimes these questions are quite intriguing. Um, so today, as I mentioned, uh, we'll sample just a few counting problems. And in particular with a an eye to maybe introducing some of the various areas that interplay in some uh, recent results. And so the objects we'll focus on today are polynomials and then very closely related matrices and number fields. For the number fields, um, there's been a lot of activity and we'll dwell a little bit on the low degree uh, situation. And one of the goals is to just hint at, since there's been so much fabulous work by many people, the tapestry of techniques present rather than to give an all-inclusive an all-inclusive uh, tour. All right, so let's begin by talking about uh, the polydomials. And I'll introduce first very vaguely a motivating question and then make it a little more precise, mention a little bit of the history, is that a random polynomial with integer coefficients, we'll make this precise, has a Galois group, which acts on the roots of the polynomial, isomorphic to Sn, which is the uh, full Galois group, 100% of the time. And one can ask, how often, if one believes this fact, how often does it not? 
you can find some discussions of this uh, in undergraduate textbooks, even uh, such as such as Dabit and Foot, and play around with some examples in low degrees. And this question is is quite interesting and can be phrased in many different variants. Um, but before I am precise with the variant I'll talk about, I'll just write that as mathematicians, yeah, we could answer 0%, um, but that's not a very satisfying answer. All right. So let's make this precise. So precisely, we expect uh, a random, we'll use this word again, polynomial of fixed degree of degree n, monic, and let's label the coefficients a1 through constant term an integer coefficients to have the gala group isomorphic to SN 100% of the time. And the quantifier of this, as in many problems in arithmetic statistics, is to have is to have some notion of height or complexity that's bounded and then take that notion to infinity. So in this case, our notion will be the maximum absolute value of the coefficients. So we'll let E and H be the number of F such that the gala group of F is not isomorphic to SN and the height of f is bounded by h, and this is just going to be the maximum of the absolute values of the coefficients. So there's several notions of height, and indeed, when counting number fields, uh, I'll use a different notion of height. But for now, this is just counting polynomials in a box where the coefficients are, are in the range of minus h to h. And we can ask, what is e and h? And before I go on, I'll just indicate there's been a lot of recent work on variants of this problem. So variants where your uh, height here can vary and you take the degree and let that go toward infinity. That's one such variant. Here we're fixing the degree. And this problem goes back at least to 1936 when uh, Van der Waarden conjectured that this count should be h to the n minus 1. Now, if we count the total such polynomials in this box, ignoring this condition, we have about h to the n such polynomials just by counting the coefficients. So this asserts that when we put this condition on the Galois group, we lose a uh, full power. And uh, this, this loss here being one, completely independent of the degree. So van der Waarden was able to show a little bit of a savings here, but it very much depended on uh, both the, the degree and, and also on, on H. And as some of you no, I believe this talk was in the seminar to show that this is now a theorem. Um, so the original announcement was from 21 by Manjal Bhargava. And this resolved van der Waarden's conjecture from uh, almost 100 years ago and was a very exciting development in the area. So let me briefly just touch on a little bit of the history, and then I'll talk about one of the tools used in this problem, how it's been uh, extended to count some other objects. So the history 
begins with maybe a statement just to mention why this bound was conjectured. It's easy to show a lower bound of h to the n minus 1. And that's from just choosing the uh, constant term to be 0, and then you get something reducible. So this is why this might be a natural uh, starting place uh, to try to show the corresponding upper bound. Van der Woerden himself uh, was able to get a little bit of a savings on the overall count. And then several notable improvements. I'll just mention a few of them. Gallagher in 1976 showed an upper bound of h to the n minus 1 half plus epsilon using the large sieve as a tool, and then removing epsilons coming originally from analysis can be very, very difficult uh, as, as a number theory. And so it took a while to be able to remove this epsilon by David Zywina using a larger sieve. And one of the uh, highlights is that there's been so many different techniques in this area. So Dietman, with very different techniques in 2012, was able to shave a little bit off of that one half using a probabilistic Galois theory. And then there's also related work by Chow and Dietman, in particular resolving this for low degrees. And as I mentioned, other variants of this problem where you can let the degree go to infinity have had a lot of recent uh, success as well. So where I began working on this type of problem stemmed from an AIM workshop. So myself and collaborators, Gaffney, Lemke Oliver, Lowry Duda, Shakan, and Zhang showed, the paper just appeared, 2023, a savings of essentially two thirds. And then of course, uh, shortly after Bargava approved the, the full conjecture. As I mentioned, one of the interesting facts about this area is that so many different techniques have been used to approach this problem. And that includes, uh, for our paper, some harmonic and Fourier analysis and a modification of a Selberg sieve. Previous papers used a different type of sieving. And then just to note that Bargava's results and his techniques differ from all of them. In particular, introducing something called the iterated discriminant or the uh, double discriminant, taking a discriminant two times. So very briefly, I'll outline the harmonic Fourier analysis and modification of the Selberg sieve that we bring into play, and then quickly move on to some extensions of this result uh, inspired by these techniques, though in the end using, using some different ones. All right, and I'll also check the uh, focus due to switching the page. So let's see how this works. Modified Selberg sieve. So I'm not assuming that anyone in the audience knows what a uh, Selberg sieve is, and I'm going to introduce it at first principles. Of course, if you've seen this before, this uh, is a very, very basic example, but I want to try to reach as wide of an audience as possible and use, uh, use no assumptions. So this problem will seem perhaps a little silly, but it does indeed illustrate how a Selberg sieve works. And once I introduce that, I can very quickly introduce the first attempt of ours in, uh, in a more complicated nature because we're counting polynomials. 
and you'll see the parallels. So under the very mild assumptions that we have some constants lambda d that are real numbers, these are usually called sieve weights. Lambda 1 equals 1, d is square free, and m is a natural number. Then I claim the following is true. The characteristic function of m equals 1 is the sum over divisors of the Mobius function, where the Mobius function, since d is square free, is just minus 1 to the number of distinct prime divisors. This fact is usually taught in elementary number theory, but it's very interesting. So we can just pause on it for a moment because it really illustrates the perfect oscillation and cancellation present in the Mobius function. From a harmonic analysis perspective, if such a function has this type of oscillation and cancellation, then this Fourier transform should behave very nicely and decay uh, in a very nice way. And so this actually really inspired us to bring the Mobius function uh, into, into our problem beyond just this, uh, this toy example. So even though this is a very simple case, it really uh, contained a lot of inspiration. The selberg sieve part of the claim is this, however, that you can upper bound this by these sieve weights only under these mild conditions. You don't need anything else. And if you haven't seen this before, you can ask why. And if you work out the right-hand side, you get the sum over d1 and d2 dividing m of lambda d1, lambda d2 when you open up the square. And this is the sum over e dividing m, the sum where the LCM of D1 and D2 is equal to E of lambda D1, lambda D2. And if you call this inner sum here, eta sub E, you can show eta one is one, and the sum over divisors of eta is always bigger than or equal to zero, and this gives an upper bound for the characteristic function, which is what we wanted to originally understand. As I said, this is a bit silly because we're working with a characteristic function, which is one of the basic tools in a mathematician's toolbox. And we even have this equality here. So why do we want an upper bound? But I think it's quite illustrative because normally the object on the left-hand side is something you don't know how to count and you want to count it by an upper bound. So in practice, you'll optimize by some sort of an optimization problem, perhaps involving Lagrange multipliers, pull those out again, uh, the choice of the lambda d's. And now I can list our first attempt at essentially doing this, even though what we're counting is much more complicated. And that is E and H, these are polynomials that for us is really the following count. And there's a few mild reductions we make. So the first is that we're counting polynomials with height H and the gala group, instead of just being not isomorphic to SN is contained in the alternating group. So this is, this is a, reduction that we're able to make. So if you accept this reduction, this is really a sum of characteristic functions where the Galois group is contained in the alternating group if I put a one here. And so it really is a summation over things that look, look like this. And by applying the Selberg sieve, we can count this. So the sum just carries over here. And now we need a condition that looks like this. And the condition that we found is sum over d, where f mod p is odd, which I won't define for all p of dividing d, because I'll very quickly show you the sieve that we ended up using. This didn't quite work. Uh, but I will mention this condition odd detects things that are in 
are in are not in the alternating group here, and so ends up being exactly the type of detector we need for our characteristic function of the Galois group being in the alternating group. So even just comparing kind of at a glance, you can see the similarities here. And if you go through this procedure and you try to optimize lambda d, this works, but it's not as good as the recent best bound of DMAP. So we needed to do something better. And our main modification is to replace the sum of squares that appears in the right-hand side by a quadratic form, very specific quadratic form. Okay. So I will move this up so we can still have the comparison of applying the original Selberg sieve. And now I'll list the actual sieve that we ended up using. So our sieve, and you can find it in this journal or on the archive, looks like this. So it will look very similar to the above. I'm going to throw on one extra condition that the discriminant of the polynomial is non-zero. That's very mild. And then keep this condition on the alternating group. And instead of counting things with weight one, I'm going to introduce a very mild weight. This may look quite drastic, but in the end, it really doesn't affect our count, just adds a, a logarithm term at the end. And essentially, for purposes of this talk, feel free to just ignore this and imagine this is one. And then the right-hand side still has this sum, but this time we have quadratic form instead of this uh, sum of squares here. And the quadratic form looks like the following. So it's a sum over D1 and D2 the product over primes dividing the LCM of D1 and D2. And now the Mobius function is going to appear again, this time the Mobius function over function fields, which behaves essentially the same way and will either give a one, a zero, or a minus one as its value. And the important thing here is that these terms, which are attached to the sieve weights here, which I can call psi sub p, are either 0, 1, or 1 half. So these are either 0, 1, or 1 half. And that's important because typically with a standard Selberg sieve, uh, at least in this application, you're getting a 0 or a 1. So it's a very binary set of choices. But here you can also get a one half, and that still provides an upper bound. Now we have a product over many primes, and so you can start to build up powers of one half and get a very tight upper bound, whereas in the regular Selberg sieve, you would just have the very coarse upper bound of one. And this is really used to our advantage. So in particular, this helps us for several ways. First of all, this is a positive definite uh, quadratic form. So it's natural that it would provide an upper bound. It has a lot of oscillation because the Mobius function that arises here uh, oscillates. And this implies that the Fourier transform has good decay. And that will become apparent in the next step that I'll write out. In addition, this Mobius function is here to begin with because it has to detect the AN condition and it does exactly this. So this will detect whether the polynomial has Gala group in AN or not. And so it does provide a true classification of exactly what we need. And also it illustrates, at least in this case, that the limits uh, to this method is, is it's really key having the alternating group here and the fact that we were able to make that reduction helped us out a lot. Now in more generality, it's um, 
conceivable that when you're trying to detect the alternating group in general, that this type of Mobius function and perhaps this type of SIF uh, would be very useful. So our next step is to apply Poisson summation. And that's exactly where the Fourier analysis comes into play. So we'll leave this sieve here. And write the next step. So the next step is to apply Poisson summation to the right hand side and use some very nice bounds on the Fourier transform of this, this Mobius function. So just as advertised, the oscillation gives some very nice Fourier decay and these were worked out um, in several recent papers. So in particular, a result of Porit gives us the bounds that, that we need. And once we plug those in, we get an upper bound for ENH. We can optimize the choice of sieve weights here to arrive at our bound of H to the N minus two thirds. Now, before I move on to number fields, which will involve a few different techniques, I'll pause for a moment to introduce uh, matrices because originally the inspiration or counting matrices had to do with some of these techniques. We ended up doing some, some different things, but one of the interesting uh, motivations for counting these matrices comes not from number theory, but from quantum chaos. And I'll mention this next, because in the theory of quantum chaos, Several researchers care a lot uh, about irreducibility of characteristic polynomials of matrices. And this directly connects to uh, the work on van der Warnen's conjecture here. And so let me introduce a relevant question that I was recently asked uh, and resolved uh, arising from quantum chaos. So this introduces a variant of counting polynomials and the question is what is the generic Galois group for symplectic matrices. And what I mean by this is take the characteristic polynomial of a symplectic matrix, you can say with entries in Z, and you can order it by height. In particular, you can just take the maximum of the entries of the matrix as one such height and ask what the generic Galois group of that characteristic polynomial is. And these questions have been around uh, for, for a while in various guises, and in particular, even just asking about the irreducibility of these characteristic polynomials is, is quite relevant. As a number theorist, I'm, I'm interested in this more uh, specific question on Galois groups, um, but there's a lot of interest in this field on just irreducibility, reducibility. And so I will very briefly uh, mention a prior result uh, in this area, but say that there's there's been quite a lot of work, and so this is by no means uh, exhaustive. And to provide a little bit of motivation for symplectic matrices, let me first state a result for special linear uh, group matrices and say that 100%, again, making this very precise with using the matrix height um, of a and S, L, and Z have the Galois group of their characteristic polynomial isomorphic to S, N. And so by introducing this version, you can see the similarity with the type of uh, questioning that I just introduced. 
And I'm not sure where this result originates from, but I found it in a paper of ribbon from about 2007, happy to be updated on perhaps the, the source of, of this, this result. And it, this illustrates that for these type of matrices, this is the generic Galois group. And of course, one can in, uh, investigate this further to see what that 100% really means. But instead of jumping there, I'll move to the application that I had in mind with some plexed matrices and list the results. So 100% of symplectic matrices now. So we're going to only consider even degrees here. Have the Galois group of their characteristic polynomial. And moreover, actually, the Galois group of the characteristic polynomial of powers, any fixed power of this matrix, will be isomorphic to S2 wreath Sn, where m is a natural number of power of the matrix. And this illustrates that for these types of matrices, the generic Galois group is the special uh, wreath product. And this result is due to myself and my collaborator, Robert Lumpy Oliver. And it will appear in an appendix to a paper on quantum chaos, and quantum cap map of Elena Kim from MIT. And let me explain before I move on why one expects this to be the generic group, even though I didn't dwell on why SN should be the generic group, um, that is probably quite natural, but why does this wreath product arise? And a reminder, of course, of what is this wreath product. So why, why this group? So let me just uh, pretend that m equals 1 to make this easy and say that the characteristic polynomial of a symplectic matrix is a reciprocal polynomial. And in particular, the eigenvalues come in n pairs. The S2 action permutes entries in a pair. And the SN action swaps pairs. But we cannot do both in S2 SN. So the eigenvalues coming in pairs is reflected by this S2 action. And you can also see this from the reciprocality of the characteristic polynomial. The SN action would swap pairs, but you're not allowed to both swap a, an element from a pair with an element from another pair. So they really do break down in this fashion and that's what's represented in the wreath product. And it makes sense when you're thinking of the eigenvalues of the, uh, the original matrix. So this group is, is quite natural. And it was satisfying to get that this is indeed the generic Galois group. And you can, of course, ask to quantify this further. And I'll just say that um, this is something that I'm looking into. So quantify this further. Um, is work in progress. All right. So in the final part of the talk, I'm going to switch to talking about number fields and in particular focus on some work in the low degree situation. But first, let me briefly outline some of the activity that's happened in the uh, middle and large degrees. And I'll also introduce the objects that we're actually counting. 
switch to a fresh sheet and check the focus here. So we can also ask to count number fields. And what is the notion of complexity here? So with polynomials and matrices, this is height or just the maximum of the absolute value of the coefficients. For number fields, you can put many things, but one natural thing to put is the discriminant. And if one asks how many number fields uh, bound a discriminant, this is a one of those easy to state, hard to count questions. And let me indeed write that down and ask what is n and x, which is the number of extensions of the rationals of, we'll fix the degree n and state that the discriminant should be bounded by a parameter x. And this is indeed finite, so it's it's good to always start there. And theorems of Ermi and Minkowski combined give you that this has a bound of O of x to the n. So it is it is bounded, but unlike the polynomial situation where that n and that degree was really needed. And when we were even looking at polynomials without full Galois group, we were just taking n minus one. Here, the conjecture, which I've heard stated as uh, folklore, I've also heard uh, appears in a work of Linux. I feel like I've additionally heard some other things, so we'll put some dots just to be safe is that this count is actually O of x. So independent of the degree. Now the implied constant should absolutely depend on the degree, but the power, which is what I've been really interested in, uh, should not. So that would be uh, very exciting to resolve this, of course, uh, quite a long way off, as you can imagine. Let me list some things that are known. Again, not at all exhaustive list. And that is for large degrees. And by large, I mean n bigger than or equal to 95. We have a lot of recent activity culminating in a result of Robert Lemke Oliver and Frank Thorne, which gives a bound of x to the c log n squared, where c is explicitly computable. So we do reduce this quite a bit for, for large degrees. For middle degrees, and by middle, it also has a very precise meaning, degrees 6 to 94. <laughs> The best result until recently was due to Schmidt from 1995. And that was just a slight savings on the x to the n. And this is due to a clever argument by counting the polynomials that cut out the number fields. So in some sense related to uh, the polynomial counts we just had. There's been a few recent improvements to Schmidt's work. And these illustrate that even saving a little bit on Schmidt is, is quite difficult. So myself and collaborators, Ila Gaffney, Kevin Hughes, Robert Lemke Oliver, David Lowry Duda, Frank Thorne, Julia Wong, and Rusheng Zhang showed uh, so the paper has just been accepted. So I'll put 2024, a little bit of savings of the form four and minus four in the denominator here. And simultaneous and with independent techniques, Bhargava 
Shankar, and Wong. This is Jerry Wong, a different one, also 2024. We're able to save a little bit more of the form 2n minus 2 uh, plus a little bit here. But the savings is is indeed uh, is indeed better. The interesting thing about uh, both of these papers is that while some elements are the same, a lot are, are quite different. And so again, highlighting some of the work on van der Rohe's conjecture, the wide variety of techniques and the wide variety of interplay of areas that, that come into this, this problem. In particular, I would say that one of the features of our work is that we use some Fourier analysis. And this paper, has a more geometry of numbers type approach, and both have some interesting developments. But I'm not going to focus on the middle degree case. For this talk, I'm going to talk about small degrees. Small degrees are n equals two, three, four, and five. And these are exciting because we have success we have this O of X bound. And N equals two here is elementary. N equals three is due to Davenport and Heilbrunn from, I believe the 1970s. And great advances made on this whole field, including this problem by, by Manjul Bhargava. And in particular, these techniques use geometry of numbers and powerful parameterization. And as some of you may know, the powerful parameterization is what limits us currently to looking at degrees less than or equal to five. And in particular, once you have this tool, you can count vectors in a pre-homogeneous vector space. And n equals four and five is due to Bhargava with very clever parameterizations and then counting the corresponding vectors after one parameterizes the objects that one wants to study by objects in a pre-homogeneous vector space. So in the end, these result to lattice point counting problems in specific types of vector spaces. Data, however, one looks at the data, however, tells a different tale. And if one studies this, one can conclude that the asymptotics, so not only do we have this bound, we actually have uh, asymptotics, which is amazing. And the data indicates that there's an error term in the asymptotics or a secondary term in the asymptotics. And since we already understand this, a recent line of investigation is try to determine how sharp those error terms are. And this is what I'll briefly discuss at the very end of this talk today. For n equals three, the error term or the secondary term in the asymptotic has been proven. And that is O of X to the five, six. So if you're counting cubic fields, you get a uh, first term constant times X and then an error term of X to the five, six. So this fairly large power contributes to what one sees in the data. And this is due to Taniguchi and Thorne. And independently, Bhargava, Shankar, 
and Zimmerman around 2011. And to echo one of the common themes of today's talk, what is amazing about these works besides actually discovering and proving this error term for cubic fields is that the techniques were different. So there were some geometry of numbers techniques here in the Bhargava Shankar and Zimmerman. And Tanaguchi and Thorne used the theory of Shintani Zaitfaj which I haven't even mentioned yet as an option. And both of these were able to arrive at this error term. Now, when one looks at higher degrees, the natural question then is, can we say the same for n equals four and five, since we also have asymptotics for that situation? And it appears that the Shintani zeta function, that Tanaguchi and Thorne, um, would be very difficult to apply in higher degree situation. But we have a new friend, and that is harmonic analysis. And harmonic analysis is great at error terms. And so in the remaining minutes, that is what I will introduce. So the new idea, which uh, I say new, but of course this uh, idea of interweaving harmonic analysis has, has been present in this area, but hopefully this is a, a new way to do so. And that is interweaving harmonic analysis in such a way as to get the best error terms possible for counting quartic and quintic fields, so n equals four and five. So as I said, I think it wor it's worth writing that harmonic analysis is great at error terms. And this leads to a result that is uh, work in progress, so 2024 plus. This is due to myself, Manjal Bhargava, and Frank Thorne. And that is the error term, term for counting quintic fields. So we're also tackling quartic fields, but I'll list the result for quintic fields, is between x to the 39 over 40 plus epsilon and x to the 79 over 80 plus epsilon. So this improves, of course, on, on other, other work in the area. And we can land somehow in here and just trying to push as, as low as possible to get the best possible term. And we do this using harmonic analysis. So how does harmonic analysis help? Now, before I, I say that, I should just mention that this number might seem a bit magical, 39 over 40, but if one looks at the cubic fields and notes that in the powerful parameterization theorems, the dimension of the underlying prehomogeneous vector space is six, the five, six has a natural interpretation. Likewise, in the n equals 5 case, the underlying dimension is 40. And so this 39 over 40, um, it's not just some mysterious number, but would be a great goal to, to push toward. But already the fact that we're able to land in here, I believe, is, is updating the, the best error term that we have. So instead of dwelling on the statement, let me just say a few words about how harmonic analysis uh, can help and hopefully sometime soon we'll have a precise error term by pushing these methods to their natural limits. So how does harmonic analysis help? The idea of this, not exactly what we use, but the idea to illustrate this is present in the Gauss circle problem. And so let me say a few words about this, because I think it's quite illustrative of 
the type of techniques that we'd like to employ in arithmetic statistics. The Gauss circle problem uh, asks for the number of lattice points in a ball centered at the origin of radius little r in R2. And one can compute this first term by using the area and ask for the error term in terms of the number of lattice points. So the ongoing line of question is, what is this error term? And one can use the area as indicated to get this main term and projection techniques or in arithmetic statistics, Davenport's lemma, as it's often referred to, to get an error term of O of R, O of little r. So projection techniques slash Davenport's lemma give E of R is O of little r. And harmonic analysis can come in and give something better. So harmonic analysis gives E of R equals O of R to the two thirds. Just to mention what the conjectured sharp bound is, is R to the one half plus epsilon. And there are techniques that do better on this. A lot of recent advances in the Gauss circle problem, but already this is a big uh, improvement from the Davenport's technique. And let me just give an indication as to why. So how is this possible? So in particular, two of the key tools are convolutions and Fourier analysis. And the following fact is useful in the Gauss circle problem is that if one takes the characteristic function of a ball that you want to count, calls this f, then the Fourier transform of f due to the curvature fact that the sphere has non-vanishing Gaussian curvature everywhere uh, satisfies this decay estimate. And therefore, this is quite widely applicable beyond just the situation of looking at balls or spheres, and you can really uh, distort this object a bit and still get reasonable bounds. And this is a very active area of harmonic analysis and using these types of problems to look at underlying Fourier decay. Poisson summation is used to count the lattice points in the error. And if one uses Poisson summation, I'm skipping many steps here, one gets a term of the sum of Fourier coefficients that are non-zero of this Fourier transform here relating to the characteristic function of the ball. But one runs into a problem because this is not summable. And so it would seem that this approach fails. That is not the case because we can make this function smoother and thus be able to sum this Fourier coefficient series that appears here. So the idea is to convolve F with a smooth bump function eta E or eta epsilon, smooth bump function. In particular, this smooth bump will be Schwartz. So this will imply that eta epsilon hat is also Schwartz. And this will have huge decay, since Schwartz functions decay faster than any polynomial. And just an idea as to how one might pick this, this eta epsilon, it's just a little bump around the origin with with say epsilon and height one over epsilon such that the integral uh, has mass one. And then if you do this appropriately, f convolved with eta 
epsilon is actually going to be roughly f. So you're really doing nothing to your function. Yet, when you take the Fourier transform, you'll get that huge decay. So in particular here, what we'll get is convolution becomes multiplication on the Fourier side. We'll get a product here with eta epsilon hat. And due to the decay, this will lead to an overall bound of r to the 1 half epsilon to the minus 1 half. And if one optimizes this with a term that appears in another part of the problem, some steps that I'm skipping, so a term that appears in another part of the estimate is, I believe, r times epsilon leads to an optimal choice of epsilon being r to the minus one third, that relates to how you choose this original function a to epsilon here, and it gives overall e of r to be o of r to the two thirds once you plug in this choice of epsilon. So even though a lot of the steps are not illustrated, you can see the two key endpoints of calculating a Fourier transform of a curved surface and choosing a convolution, a to epsilon, to mimic your original function, yet be optimal in the various parts of the problem, including a Poisson summation step, saves an entire third over the Davenport or projection style techniques. And so just to conclude, this is just a glimpse, just a glimpse at how harmonic analysis yields good error terms in counting lattice points, which will then employ to counting objects that are parameterized by these lattice points in the field of arithmetic statistics. Now, of course, it's not as simple as just importing Gauss circle problem in this case, but at least that's the inspiration. And I believe these techniques are even more applicable and hope to be able to employ them in a wide variety of counting problems in arithmetic statistics. And I think I will end there. Thank you.